your AP exam is coming up and you're in a state of panic, or you just saw the title of this video and you want to learn everything in AP Calculus AB in 20 minutes. Well, either way, I'm going to go over everything you need to know for the course and exam. I'll also tell you an effective note-taking strategy that will be useful not only for studying for the exam, but could also be useful in all of your future classes. Let's get straight to the point, starting with the effective note-taking strategy, which is taking concise notes is significantly more useful than taking long notes. Remember this. This is especially true if you're preparing for an exam. You want to note down short ideas such as formulas, important properties, definitions, and steps or strategies because these will help you solve problems. And whenever you miss a practice question, it's best to understand the solution and note down what key concept that you didn't know before so that the next time you see a similar problem, you'll know how to do it. It's best not to make your notes too long, for example, by putting too much stuff that you already know or worked out examples, because long notes are easy to forget. And throughout this video, I will help you with concise note taking. There are six sections in this video, and at the start of each section, I will begin with an overview of short bullet points, which you can note down, and to make your notes even more concise, you only need to note down what's not quite familiar to you. So here is section one, limits and continuity. This is the overview slide. Pause to read and take notes on it. All right, let's start off with a simple limit. The limit as x approaches 1 of 2x, which means as x approaches 1, what does 2x approach? Well, from this table of values, we can see that f of x gets closer and closer to 2. And using direct substitution, we can solve that the limit indeed does equal 2. But we can't always use direct substitution. Let's consider a piecewise function. f of x equals x squared if x is not equal to 1 and 1 1.5 if x equals 1. What is the limit of f of x as x approaches 1? In this case, we can't use direct substitution because there is a jump at x equals 1. The answer is 1 because as x approaches 1, x squared approaches 1. The limit doesn't care about what happens at x equals 1. Here's another example where you can't use direct substitution. If you do, you get 0 divided by 0. However, you can factor the numerator and cancel out like terms, which turns the function into x plus 2. Now you can use direct substitution, and you get the answer of 4. There are some reasons why limits may not exist. The first is if you get a different result depending on which direction you approach the specified value from. In this piecewise function, for example, the limit as x approaches negative 9 doesn't exist. Another reason is if the graph oscillates infinitely. For sine of 1 over x, as x approaches 0, f of x continuously swings back and forth between negative 1 and 1 increasingly quickly, so the limit doesn't exist. Another reason is if the limit is unbounded. Infinity and negative infinity aren't considered numbers, so the limit is considered non-existent. Now into discontinuities. Remember that continuity at x equals c means that f of c equals the limit as x approaches c of f of x. There are a few types of discontinuities. The first piecewise function you saw earlier has a removable discontinuity at x equals 1. The second piecewise function you saw has a jump discontinuity at x equals negative 9 because the limit from the left doesn't equal the limit from the right. And finally, if a function is undefined at any input, it's not continuous at those inputs. Let's see why the first discontinuity is removable. The key is that the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x exists, unlike in the other cases where the limit didn't exist. If we redefine f of 1 as 1, which is what the limit equals, then f is now continuous at x equals 1. And finally, the intermediate value theorem, which states that if f is continuous on the closed interval a comma b and d is between f of a and f of b, there exists an x between a and b such that f of x equals d. So here's an example. If we consider f of x equals x squared on the interval 0 to 2, f of 0 equals 0 and f of 2 equals 4. So if you pick any value d between 0 and 4, there exists an x value between 0 and 2 such that f of x equals d. Now we're into section 2. The overview for this section is two slides long. Here is the first slide. Pause if you want to read over it. And here is the second. So we begin with average rate of change. Here is an example where you're given a table of the volume of water in a tank at certain times. What is the average rate at which water flows into the tank for the first four seconds? That's just the average rate of change from t equals 0 to t equals 4. Using the formula, you get an answer of 2.5 liters per second. Then the question asks you to approximate f prime of 3.5. The closest values to 3.5 in the table are 3 and 4, so we just compute the average rate of change from t equals 3 to t equals 4, which is 4 liters per second. 
Now let's look into the conditions for a function to be differentiable at any particular value. First, it must be continuous at that value. So in this left example, since f isn't continuous at x equals zero, it's not differentiable at x equals zero. Second, the limit as x approaches c of f prime of x must exist. In the second example, the limit as x approaches zero of the slope from the right is not the same as the slope from the left, so f isn't differentiable at x equals zero. Solving derivatives is quite easy if you remember the important derivatives and rules, especially the chain rule. Let's take the derivative of this seemingly complicated function. First, we have the product of cosine x and sine of x squared. Using the product rule, the derivative of that is the derivative of cosine of x times sine of x squared plus cosine of x times the derivative of sine of x squared. And then we add the derivative of the second term, 3x cubed, from which we can pull out the constant 3. Next, we evaluate the derivatives. To use the chain rule to differentiate sine of x squared, the inside function is x squared, whose derivative is 2x, and then times the outside function is sine of x, whose derivative is cosine of x, but since the inside function is x squared, we replace x with x squared. And if you want to simplify further, this is the final answer. We can also differentiate an implicit function. For example, if we have x squared plus y squared equals 100, we differentiate both sides. The derivative of x squared is 2x. And differentiating y squared using the chain rule, the inside function is y, whose derivative is y prime, and the outside function is x squared, whose derivative is 2x, but we replace x with the inside function y. On the right side, the derivative of a constant is 0, and solving for y prime, it's equal to negative x over y. Using implicit differentiation, we can differentiate inverse functions. So if y equals f inverse of x, that means f of y equals x. Differentiating both sides using the chain rule on the left side gives y prime times f prime of y. The right side is just one. Solving for y prime gives one over f prime of y and replace y with f inverse of x. Now we can use this formula to differentiate an inverse trig function. We have f inverse of x is the inverse sine of x, so f of x equals sine of x. On the right side of our formula, f prime, the derivative of sine of x, is just cosine of x, and on the inside we have inverse sine of x. You can simplify cosine of inverse sine of x by drawing a right triangle with one angle equal to inverse sine of x, and as you can see, adjacent over hypotenuse equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. So we can plug that back in to get our final answer. If you're curious, here are the derivatives of the other inverse trig functions, though I do not recommend remembering these. Now we're into section three. The overview for this section is also two slides long. Here's the first slide, and here's the second. We'll come back to rectilinear motion in a later section. For now, we'll start off with related rates. Here's an example. The radius of a sphere is increasing at a rate of one meter per second. What is the rate at which the volume is changing when the radius is two meters? Well, you know the formula for the volume of a sphere, and you want to solve for the rate at which the volume is changing, dv over dt, so you differentiate both sides with respect to t. The problem gave you dr over dt and r, so by plugging those in, you get dv over dt equals 16 pi cubic meters per second. Here's an example of L'Hopital's rule. If you plug in x equals zero into this limit, you get an indeterminate form. So L'Hopital's rule states that you can differentiate the numerator and denominator. In this case, you get cosine of x over one. Now you can use direct substitution and you get the answer of one. The mean value theorem. So here's an example of a piecewise function and its graph. It's continuous on the closed interval zero to four, including at x equals zero and differentiable on the open interval zero to four. Notice it doesn't have to be differentiable at x equals zero. The average rate of change from 0 to 4 is 1 half, so the mean value theorem states that there exists an x between 0 and 4 such that the derivative at x is 1 half, and it turns out x equals 1 in this case. All right, for the first derivative test, you have to find the critical points of f of x by solving for where f prime of x equals 0 or does not exist. In this example, if we differentiate and set the result equal to 0, we get the critical points of 1, 7 over 3 and 3, 1. And there are no points where f prime of x does not exist. To find the global min and max on a closed interval, you must test all the critical points and endpoints. In this case, you see that the lowest y value out of all of these points is 1, and the highest is 7 over 3. So those are the global min and max respectively. To determine concavity, you solve for the second derivative of f 
And on intervals where it's negative, F is concave down, whereas on intervals where it's positive, it's concave up. The inflection points are where S double prime changes sign. To determine whether a critical point, which we found all of them in the last slide, is a local minima or maxima, if the graph is concave down on the interval where the critical point lies, it's a local maxima, whereas if it's concave up, it's a local minima. And here's a graph of our function in case you want to verify all our results are correct. The local linear approximation is just the equation of the line tangent to a point. So for the local linear approximation of square root of x at x equals 1, for example, you just plug in the values into the formula for the tangent line, and you can solve for f prime of x using the power rule. The equation you get is L of x equals 0.5x plus 0.5. To approximate the square root of 1.1, you just plug 1.1 into this equation to get 1.05. And this is an overestimate because if you solve for f double prime, you'll get that the graph is concave down on its entire domain, so the tangent line is always above the graph. And here's what the graph looks like. Now we're beginning section four, integrals. The overview for this section is two slides long. Here's the first slide, and here's the second. So the relationship between integrals, antiderivatives, and areas is quite straightforward and could be remembered quite easily just by looking at the overview. So we're going to jump right into the Riemann sum, which is a topic that's easier to remember by visualizing what's happening rather than remembering formulas. To approximate the area under the curve of a function, you can split it up into rectangles. The height of each rectangle can be f of x at the left, right, or midpoint of the rectangle. And usually we assume that the rectangles have the same width, which is the interval length divided by the number of rectangles. And on the sign note, the shapes don't have to be rectangles. You can do Riemann sums with trapezoids or other shapes as well. To find the total area of the rectangles, you want to consider the height of each rectangle, f of x. For a right Riemann sum, the x value for the i-th rectangle is a plus i times b minus a over n. The exact area is the limit as n approaches infinity of the width of each rectangle times the sum of the heights of all rectangles. Now we'll talk about u substitution, which is useful when you see a function and its derivative somewhere inside an integral. We see 0.5x inside this integral, whose derivative is 0.5, which isn't explicitly inside the integral, but due to the properties of integrals, we can put a 0.5 inside. So now we set u equals 0.5x, which means du equals 0.5 dx, and since we're evaluating a definite integral, we have to change the bounds to what u would be equal to at the given bounds for x. So substituting the values for u and du into the integral, we now just have the integral of sine u du, and the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, which if you evaluate from 0 to 0 0.5 pi, gives you the answer of 2. Now into long division. So if you have to integrate a rational function and you can't use u substitution, your best bet is probably long division. So if you divide this out, you would get 2 minus 1 over 2x plus 3. And now you can just integrate this. The integral of 2 is 2x. And if you use u substitution to integrate the fraction, you would get minus 1 half ln of the absolute value of 2x plus 3. And since this is an indefinite integral, make sure to add a plus c at the end. And then completing the square just relies on remembering the formulas you saw from the overview slide which I know isn't the most exciting, but fortunately, this method isn't tested that often. But anyway, if you break down the 41 in this problem to 25 plus 16, then you can complete the square, and then plugging this into the formula, you would get the integral is 1 fourth arctangent of x plus 5 over 4 plus c. Now starting section 5. The overview for this section is only one slide. Pause to read over it. Starting with rectilinear motion, there are important differences between terms which seem similar. Displacement is the change in position, while distance is the total amount moved. Velocity has both a magnitude and direction, so if you're moving in the negative x direction, it could be negative. And speed is the absolute value of velocity. So for example, if you move at a velocity of 5 meters per second for 2 seconds and then negative 5 meters per second for 2 seconds, you can integrate velocity with respect to time to get that your displacement and average velocity are both zero because you end up where you started while your speed is constantly 5 meters per second and your total distance is 20 meters. Now into evaluating volume. This tends to be one of the more difficult topics in the course, but it's much easier if you see what's going on. 
Here's an example. The base of a solid is the region enclosed by the graphs y equals x and y equals x squared from x equals 0 to x equals 1. The solid has rectangular cross sections perpendicular to the x axis with height h. What is the volume of the solid? Well, let's visualize this. Here are the graphs of the functions. And at a particular x value, such as 0 0.5, the cross section is a rectangle with base equal to the distance between the two curves and height equal to x. We know the area of a rectangle is base times height, so if we just integrate this area formula from 0 to 1, we get the total volume, which in this case is 1 12th. Here's an example of the washer method. Let R be the region enclosed by the graphs y equals x and y equals x squared from x equals 0 to x equals 1. A solid is generated by rotating R about the line x equals negative 1. What is the volume of the solid? All right, since we're dealing with x equals negative 1 as our axis of rotation, we have to change our curves to be a function of x in terms of y and the bounds to be y values. So here are the graphs and the axis of rotation. At any particular y value, we are rotating the graphs around our axis of rotation to get a circle with a hole in it. As you can see from the graphs, the distances from the axis to the graphs are the square root of y plus 1 and y plus 1 respectively. So by plugging those into the formula for the volume, we get this integral. Later, I'll show you how to evaluate this definite integral with your calculator. It's approximately 1.571. Last section, section 6. The overview for this section is only one slide. Pause to read over it. So differential equations relate a function and its derivatives. Here is an example. The velocity of a particle is inversely proportional to its position x. Using k as a constant, what differential equation describes this relationship? Well, velocity is the derivative of x with respect to time, and since it's inversely proportional to x, it's equal to k over x. Here's an example of a question that asks you to find the differential equation of a shown slope field. Notice that the slope at any point is only dependent on y and not dependent on x, and that the slope is zero when y equals negative two and two. This suggests that dy over dx is of the form some constant c times y plus two times y minus two. After distributing, the only answer option that is of this form is b. To solve a differential equation using separation of variables, the key is to get all x's and dx's to one side and all the t's and dt's to the other. After that, it's just integration in algebra. And notice that at one point, we have 2 times the constant c0, which is also a constant, so we can replace it with c1. In the end, we get the general solution. If you were given an initial condition, you can plug it in and solve for c1. Now I'll show you tricks to use on your graphing calculator. The first trick is how to graph functions and find zeros. So if you type in a function such as x squared minus 4, if you press graph, it shows you the graph. And to find the zeros, hit second, calc, and then 0, which is 2. So you want to set the left and right bounds. So if you want to find this 0 right over here, then x equals 0 is obviously to the left of that x value. And for the right bound, choose an x value to the right. And then you see that the 0 is x equals 2, which is what we expected. To calculate definite integrals on your calculator, go to math, f and int, which is 9, and then enter the lower and upper bounds and your function, such as x squared, and then the variable. And you see it gives 2.33, which is what we expected. All right, that's everything. If you're taking the exam, good luck. I believe in you, and you should too. If you found this video helpful, check out my channel where I have other videos on other courses that could also be of interest to you. For those of you taking the BC exam, I'll also have a review video for that up. Thanks for watching and have a great day.